Reading from the book of the prophet Daniel. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his lords, with whom he drank. Under the influence of the wine, he ordered the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem to be brought in so that the king, his lords, his wives, and his entertainers might drink from them. When the gold and silver vessels taken from the house of God in Jerusalem had been brought in, and while the king, his lords, his wives, and his entertainers were drinking wine from them, they praised their gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. Suddenly, opposite the lampstand, the fingers of a human hand appeared, writing on the plaster of the wall in the king's palace. When the king saw the wrist and hand that wrote, his face blanched, his thoughts terrified him, his hip joints shook, and his knees knocked. Then Daniel was brought into the presence of the king. The king asked him, Are you the Daniel, the Jewish exile, whom my father, the king, brought from Judah? I have heard that the Spirit of God is in you, that you possess brilliant knowledge and extraordinary wisdom. I have heard that you can interpret dreams and solve difficulties. If you are able to read the writing and tell me what it means, you shall be clothed in purple, wear a gold collar around your neck, and be third in the government of the kingdom. Daniel answered the king, you may keep your gifts or give your presents to someone else, but the writing I will read for you, O king, and tell you what it means. You have rebelled against the Lord of heaven. You had the vessels of his temple brought before you, so that you and your nobles, your wives and your entertainers might drink wine from them. And you praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, that neither see nor hear, nor have intelligence. But the God in whose hand is your life breath, and the whole course of your life you did not glorify. By him were the wrist and hand sent, and the writing set down. This is the writing that was inscribed. Mini, Tekiel, and Perez. These words mean, meaning, God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Tekiel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. And Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Verbum Domini. Give glory and eternal praise to him. Sun and moon, bless the Lord. Praise and exalt him above all forever. Stars of heaven, bless the Lord. Praise and exalt him above all forever. Every shower and dew, bless the Lord. Praise and exalt him above all forever. All ye winds, bless the Lord. Praise and exalt him above all forever. Fire and heat, bless the Lord. 
praise and exalt him above all forever. Cold and chill, bless the Lord. Praise and exalt him above all forever. Dominus Fobiscum. Lexia Sancti Evangelii Secundum Luca. Jesus said to the crowd, They will seize and persecute you. They will hand you over to the synagogues and to prisons and they will have you led before kings and governors because of my name. It will lead to your giving testimony. Remember, you are not to prepare your defense beforehand, for I myself shall give you a wisdom in speaking that all your adversaries will be powerless to resist or refute. You will even be handed over by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair on your head will be destroyed. By your perseverance, you will secure your lives. Verbum Domini. Today in the Gospel, Jesus promises us persecution. It will be led before kings and governors because of my name. It will lead to your giving testimony. And certainly the martyrs give such eloquent tes testimony to that God alone is God. He is the one alone that we serve and love and obey supremely. And the early church especially honored martyrs uh, so deeply because of this, this powerful witness the martyrs give to the church. Today we celebrate St. Andrew, Andrew Dung Lok and the Vietnamese martyrs. Uh, they were martyred between 1820 and 1862 in Vietnam. There was 117 Christians in all that we honor today, uh, 96 of them were from Vietnam, 21 missionaries from Spain and France, eight were bishops, 80, eight, or 50 were priests, and 60 were lay people. And Andrew Dunlock himself uh, was, uh, he converted as a young man, became a catechist, and then a priest in 1823. But in this time period, between 1820 and 1862, it's believed there was between 100 and 300,000 martyrs in Vietnam. And that's only this 42 years. They'd suffered for centuries there, the 20th century, no less, you know, great persecution of Catholics. <clears throat> so today, they witnessed to us 
of the primacy of God in our life, that he is, he is everything. Jesus tells us today that we are not to prepare your defense beforehand, for I myself shall give you a wisdom in speaking that all your adversaries will be powerless to resist or refute. That we are to depend on the Holy Spirit, certainly for strength and wisdom in speaking, the testimony that we are to give. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts hearts. These words must be inspired by him, must come from him. But we're called to be faithful, and he promises that we'll be given what we need. Faithful in small things, and then some are called to big things. But certainly, those who do the great works of God are faithful in the small things as well. And we all have the opportunity to be faithful in the small things. Our Lord tells us, you will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair on your head will be destroyed by your perseverance. You will secure your lives. Why would Christians be persecuted? We talk about faith in God, we talk, in, we talk about love, and we do perform service for the poor, for the least, for our brothers and sisters. What's the problem? Why would the world have such a, an issue with this? <clears throat> and I think a large part of the problem for the world is that Christians also stand for the truth versus the false idols of the world, against the false morality that's proclaimed in a fallen world. You know, the Christians stand for the dignity of the human person. When it is violated, they are to, to speak out, to fight for justice. We see in our history, especially this past history, where atheistic governments that want total control over the people have wreaked great suffering on Christians and believers. St. Teresa of Avila said that truth suffers but never dies. Truth suffers but never dies. You know, if we stand for the truth, we're willing to suffer for that, but you can't stamp it out, you can't wipe it out, you can't change it. It's, it's there, it's part of the natural law. You can't change the truth, you can't alter it. We're just called to live it. The fallen world operates by a different logic than Christianity. Christians are called to surrender to God, to serve him alone. In the fallen world, made of, of fallen human beings, there's a focus on the self, on the ego, our own self-will. And then there's a power struggle that ensues after that. Who's going to get what they want? And people are willing to use force to achieve that end, you know, to serve themselves. And Jesus promises that we will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair on your head will be destroyed. Meaning that we're destined for eternal life. This short life will end, and we will live forever, God willing, by his grace, for all eternity, in the beatific vision, and the joy and happiness and peace of heaven. So he tells us today, by your perseverance, you will secure your lives. How important perseverance is. Again, Teresa of Avila would say, let nothing disturb you, let nothing make you afraid. All things are passing. God alone never changes. Patience gains all things. If you have God, you want for nothing. God alone suffices. And we can be so disturbed and anxious and fearful, but if we come to that back to that reality of focusing on God, that if we have him, we have everything. We'll want for nothing. We're destined for eternal life with him. In a sense, that begins now. That fullness of life 
can begin now if we focus on God, if we seek his will every day. If we have a, a real life of prayer. And again, Teresa of Avila, a great doctor of prayer, would speak about how necessary perseverance, how essential, she would say, perseverance is in the life of prayer, the temptations against it, the distractions we have. She would say, for those of us who are particularly wicked, we need to spend more time in prayer. <laughs> so if you struggle with wickedness, if you seem like you have a, a, a deeply fallen human nature, spend more time in prayer. Draw closer to the Holy One of God. Seek out Christ, experience his love, receive his grace. We can't do this by our our will alone. Oftentimes we think of perseverance, maybe we think of just kind of white knuckling, toughing it out. But I think, and I've heard this said, that the will is like a muscle. And we know if our muscles, if we keep working it, working it alone, it will fail. Our muscles wear out, they tire, they get exhausted. So we can't depend on our will alone. And we need to have this prayer life and this dependence on God. That's how we express this hope in God, this dependence on God that we are to have, to come to him in prayer, to ask for the grace that we need. And I like to look at perseverance as a, continually, a continual turning and depending on God. That's the secret to perseverance, not just toughing it out and gutting it out, so to speak, but am I turning to God in the trials and the difficulties for the help that I need? And he leads me to solutions. It might be other people that help me or situations, a word. But that perseverance without grace will falter. And I've quoted this before, but I know a spiritual writer said something that struck me that you know, if you're in a situation that seems so difficult and you're tempted to quit, not to, to persevere, you have anxiety, you know, we're called to trust him. And you just feel like you can't trust him. It's just, this might happen, that might happen. I can't trust God with this. And the spiritual advice is, well, trust him anyway. Trust him anyway. I love that. Because, you know, we can't just rely on reason or some false optimism. Everything's going to work out right. Trust him anyway. We're destined for eternal life. He is everything. If we have him, we have everything. For me, the, the martyrs witness to this, this complete, total self-giving -give, to God and dependence on him. <laughs>